Hello and welcome to a very special, very momentous uh, edition of Read Through the Bible 2.0. This is our last time getting together. I was going to say in 2021, but 2021 is already in the rearview mirror. This is our last set of chapters discussing the last few chapters of the Old Testament as we have now concluded Read Through the Bible 2021. So I want to say congratulations to everybody. Feel free to give yourself a pat on the back or a hip hip hooray or something like that. But I hope it's been a good experience for you. It has certainly been a marathon, uh, you know, compared to a sprint or something that might be uh, a few days or weeks effort. This was a real momentous thing. Um, before this year, I had read every book of the Bible, but never in a row and never all together. So don't know if anybody else is in the same boat. Anybody else for them? This is their first time reading through the whole Bible in a year. Yeah. All right. I had only ever done it piecemeal before. But I'm so glad that we did it. I feel like I know the word better and like I know my Lord better. And I just have a wonderful feeling about it. Anybody want to say anything about how the experience has been before we dive into tonight's chapters? It was definitely enjoyable. I, uh, I, I really have been blessed this year. I've enjoyed very much uh, most of the year when you were doing the daily YouTube videos. Uh, I would read it and it's like my treat is to listen to the, <laughs> the comments that you make. And also as I read, I have questions in my mind. What would he talk about this and how would he address that? And so it was very, very enjo enjoyable and rewarding. And the one theme that kept repeating throughout all that, not that I didn't know that, but it was more clear than ever of God's mercy Amen. and God's always willing to pardon and um, so patient with us. Mm -hmm. And we serve an amazing God. And so it was a definitely a, a, a huge blessing to me, definitely challenging some parts, oh, yes. uh, but overall it's, it's wonderful. Yeah, very true. Thank you for sharing. Anyone else? Well, I want to thank this group in particular for keeping the momentum going, especially in the latter part of the year. You know, when I started teaching the class in August and I knew I was going to have to drop the daily commentaries, it would have been so easy to just let the whole effort go by the wayside. But this gave me a reason, you know, to keep in it, keep engaged, because I knew that every week we'd be discussing these chapters. And so thank you all. The group effort really makes the difference. So it's been wonderful. Anything else before we begin to dive into the word? Well, this Wednesday prayer group uh, has just been through a season of prayer, but we do want to pray as we open the word for the Holy Spirit to do its work in each of our hearts and also for those watching on YouTube. So is it okay if we bow our heads? Let's pray. Dear Lord God, you have brought us along on this journey. You have brought us to this place, dear Heavenly Father, and it is with victory that we have our concluding discussion of these last half dozen chapters or so of Read Through the Bible. Thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for all your words through the prophets, through the apostles, and most importantly, through your Son. Dear Holy Spirit, you who inspired the scriptures, I want to pray that one more time, the scriptures would do their work in our hearts, dear Heavenly Father. Uh, guide us where we need to be guided. Convict us where we need to be convicted. Give us wisdom where we are foolish. Give us compassion where we are, by our own nature, hard-hearted. Uh, Lord, thank you for your servants, uh, Zechariah and Malachi, uh, in whose chapters we will be tonight. And we pray that the message that was to strike the hearts of uh, the people of Judah would also strike our hearts in the correct way. Not to make us uh, overly harsh or judgmental, but for us to realize that we need your mercy just as much as the people of Judah do. So please bless the different families uh, represented here on the Zoom meeting. Bless the families of those who are watching after the fact on YouTube. And I pray that we can continue to be your people, walking in the light of your truth, uh, shining your light in the community uh, that you love so much. We pray all this in Jesus' blessed name. Amen. Amen. Okay, with that said, tonight's chapters are Zechariah 10 through 14, and then Malachi 1 through 4. Uh, I have to admit, of all the places in the Bible, the place that I least often go to just naturally, or in sermon prep or whatever, is these minor prophets. And so, 
you know, I had a thought, uh, I don't know, six or eight weeks ago, but it has defined how I read these minor prophet chapters. Even when there's doom and gloom and destruction prophesied, the warning itself is God's mercy. Because if God was just going to be cruel and wipe out his people, he wouldn't have had to warn them. Because the warning is intended to be a deterrent, you know? Same thing in the days of Noah. If God really wanted to be rid of humanity, he wouldn't have had to talk to Noah. But the fact that he talks, the fact that he warns, the fact that he at least gives people the option to repent, even if they don't take them up on that option too often, uh, that is incredibly merciful. Yeah? I was thinking of that when you were talking about mercy system. So let's uh, examine what God has mercifully said through his prophets tonight. Is that okay? All right. So we are... Uh, going on with Zechariah 10. Uh, hopefully most of us have had a chance to read it, but if not, you know, no, no big problem. It's okay if you're perceiving this for the first time or the second time here. But it starts out by saying, oh, by the way, all this chapter is uh, poetic. Chapter 10 is all poetry. We can't read it in poetry, but it would be interesting to have that dimension of beauty while getting this input of, of information. Yeah. It says, ask Yahweh for rain, Rain in the time of the latter rain, and that's hopefully a phrase that made your ears perk up, right? There's the former and the latter rain. In the times of Israel, the former rains would come in the fall time, and the latter rains would come in the spring. Both were necessary for uh, plants to germinate and grow. Uh, you needed the soil to be softened and get those seeds started in the former rain, but then it's the latter rain that brings the harvest. And the spiritual application for that is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts was the metaphorical former reign of the Holy Spirit. We are looking forward to a great movement in the last days of the latter reign in which there'll be a significant harvest for Jesus and for his kingdom. Amen. So in light of that illustration, we read here, ask Yahweh for rain in the time of latter reign, and Yahweh will make dark clouds flash, flash as with lightning, and generous rain will pour. And there will be grass in the field for all. Uh, Israel is a semi-arid land. And just as we are concerned year over year about will we get enough rain? And is there going to be drought? Same preoccupation was in the mind of the Israelites. But ask Yahweh for rain. He will send his rain. And that certainly has a practical, literal application and a spiritual application for us with the Holy Spirit. Let's see, we have that song in our hymnal, don't we? Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. So interesting living in Southern California that our physical state mirrors our spiritual state. Pray for that ring. Any thoughts on that concept before we move on? Okay. In contrast to faithfully asking God for rain, what so many people seemed to run after in Bible times, and probably from heaven's sight, it still looks pretty similar in the modern days, idolatry. Idolatry, on the other hand, is delusion and lies. People who follow it are like sheep lacking a shepherd, just wandering aimlessly under their own whims. Uh, sheep are very foolish, I understand, and they really need someone to guide them. And from heaven's perspective, we probably look pretty similar. Uh, God says here, he uses the first person, my anger is kindled against the leaders, the shepherds of Jerusalem. And it says, Yahweh will visit his flock and make them like his royal horse in battle. I was thinking, wow, he's interesting mix of a metaphor. Uh, sheep, which are humble and meek, and I think kind of stubborn and stupid. Uh, he will make them like a valiant battle horse. Yes, royal horse in battle. They will fight and be victorious, and God makes all this possible. He has made the implements of war. He has made the people who use those implements. God makes it all possible to have victory. Back in the first person here, God says, I will strengthen the house of Judah, and they will win back Joseph and Ephraim. You know, there were these other tribes of Israel that had been lost to the Assyrians. And God says, they will be restored as if I had never left them. That's a beautiful promise. Though they're scattered in far countries, they shall return. And it uses the names of surrounding countries geographically from Israel, from Egypt and Assyria and Lebanon and Gilead. 
And then there's some reminiscent language about escaping from Egypt, you know, that was in Israel's history. And so it uses some of that language again. And it talks about Assyria and Egypt, countries that intimidated Israel and harassed Israel. They will be humbled and defeated. Always people will be strengthened by him and they will march in his name. March forward in his name. Pretty inspiring chapter, huh? Just there into the left. Any thoughts on this? No? I'm just remembering that Zechariah uh, prophesied after the captivity of Israel. And so I thought maybe we'll get through these last few chapters without some of the doom and gloom prophesied. We certainly didn't have any, well, we didn't have much of it here except for the surrounding nations. But there is more doom and gloom prophesied in future chapters. Further comments on chapter 10 before going on to 11? Yeah. No? Okay, chapter 11. Now, interestingly, the first three verses are poetic still, but then after that, it's not. And it really seems like the text of one through three is the continuation of chapter one. So I'm kind of wondering if they put the chapter break in the long place, wrong place. Just remember that the chapter and verse divisions are not divinely inspired. Those were added much, much later for the purpose of quick reference. But those first few verses, it uh, continues talking about destruction for nations around Israel, Lebanon and Bashan, <laughs> as frequently happened with the minor prophets, they use illustrations from nature, like cedars falling and oaks. And it says, the thick forest has come down and the shepherds will wail in despair. Yeah. And then it goes into an extensive uh, illustration of God being against the shepherds. Uh, Yahweh God says, the shepherds will be slaughtered for they slaughtered my flock. And thought nothing of it. They only thought of their profit. You know, a good shepherd cares for the sheep. Of course, there's the shearing time. And of course, there is the time sending it either to sacrifice or to the marketplace. But they, they slaughtered sheep thinking of nothing except the price they would get for it. Interesting illustration between what real shepherds would do and what the leaders of Israel were doing with God's people. And uh, God has an illustration for Zechariah. This sounded very much like uh, Jeremiah or Hosea for me here. Uh, you uh, shall feed the flock to prepare it for slaughter. And Zechariah took two staffs, and the two staffs he gave two names, beauty and honor. Although my Bible had some footnotes about some other possible ways to translate those terms like unity and, and things like that. I uh, said beauty and bonds. Say it again. Verse 4, beauty and the other I called bonds. Bonds. B-O-N-D-S. Okay. okay. All right. Beauty and bonds. Uh, and I think that's the one that can also be translated unity. Uh, Zechariah dismissed the loathsome shepherds that had been taking charge of the sheep. And then it says he starved the sheep. I think this is an illustration of what the shepherds of Israel were doing with Israel. Uh, Zechariah took the beauty rod and broke it in half, representing the broken covenant. Now Israel had broken its covenant. And Zechariah said, if it is agreeable to you, I will take my wages and depart. And so it said they paid him his wages, 30 pieces of silver. And I was thinking, boy, is that, uh, is that prophetically significant or is that just coincidental that it's the same amount for which Jesus was betrayed? Yeah. Um, and then in the next verse, it seems to continue. It says, Yahweh said to throw the wages to the potter. So Zechariah did so. And I was remembering that Judas took that money and uh, cast it to the temple. And that's what it says here. Zechariah cast it to the temple to go to the potter. Judas cast his money to the temple and they bought a potter's field to turn it into a cemetery. Uh, so just interesting, uh, like it kind of just has parallels there with what happened right at the end of Jesus' life. Isn't that something? Anybody have any thoughts on that? Perhaps the prophetic significance there? I definitely saw the, the, the 30 pieces of silver and the way it was thrown. It definitely mirrors what happened at the time of Jesus' betrayal and uh, uh, betrayal and arrest. 
but again, it kind of doesn't make sense. Um, that's from my end. Like I can see the similarities, but the whole thing kind of don't, doesn't make sense. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is true. It's possible, but maybe not an airtight case. And I wish I had the opportunity with all this to go into commentaries and see what commentators and scholars have said. But with the volume of that we're reading each week, I just don't have time to examine that. Go ahead with what you were saying, Nick. No problem. Don't you see the first of the good and false shepherd? That's right. Yep. He's a good shepherd. Yep. And that's going to lead them into the right sheep fold. Amen. Praise the Lord. Absolutely. That shepherd goes, uh, that shepherd illustrations in many books, obviously Psalm 23 also, right? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Yeah. All right. Then Zechariah took the other staff called bonds or unity uh, to represent, oh, he broke it in half to represent the divorce of Judah and Israel. And then Yahweh told him to go take the implements of a foolish shepherd. I wasn't quite sure what that meant. But it says, God will raise up a shepherd who doesn't feed the flock, nor care, nor seek their young, nor heal, but will eat the meat of the flock. They only fill their bellies off of the flock they're supposed to care for. And the last verse goes back to poetry. It says, woe to the worthless shepherd. His right eye will be gouged out and his right arm will be cut off. So I was thinking, man, what this meant, you know, for the priests uh, uh, at the time. And what it means for spiritual leaders today, you know, the big responsibility to have folks in your care and speak representing God. You know, you're supposed to care for them gently, but to just see them as objects for slaughter and profit and feeding oneself, woe to them. Well, let's remember from the kids that all the pastors or priests that were called shepherds mm. will have that multitude swarm upon them in the last day. Wow. Yeah, they'll have a very bad ending. Yeah, dreadful thoughts. So hope for not, they will end up as they. As yeah, they yeah. Okay. Any further comments on Zechariah eleven before we go on to twelve? All right, then moving on into Zechariah twelve, and this one is a strong one: a prophecy of destruction against Israel and Judah. And again, it has very thorough, very, uh, you know, picturesque descriptions of chaos and demolition. Uh, it talks about, you know, the horse and rider will be thrown into confusion and madness. And every eye that opens will be blinded. And uh, just some kind of gory uh, descriptions there. It talks like, it says, the governors of Judah will be like a fiery torch amid sheaves, sheaves of wheat, I assume. Uh, and you know what a fiery torch would do in a recently harvested field, right? Uh, it says the people will be devoured. Yet, Jerusalem will be inhabited yet again. And on this, I couldn't help but think of, you know, there is destruction around the new Jerusalem in the book of Revelation chapter uh, 20. Yet, Jerusalem is populated and thrives in chapters 21 and 22. So this could be... It could be a medium-term prophecy. It could be a super long-term prophecy. It could be a double prophecy. It could be both. Um, and obviously, we know, as Jesus prophesied in Matthew 24, uh, Israel, Jerusalem did fall in AD 70. So. But, praise the Lord, again, after destruction, there is hope. God will save Judah in Jerusalem. The people will be strengthened. And in this section, the days of David are hearkened back to, you know, back to those glory days of Israel. Mm -hmm. It says, any nation that comes against Jerusalem will be destroyed. It says, the spirit of grace and supplication will be poured out on Jerusalem, and they will look upon me who they pierced. And that's, I believe, God talking in the first person. Is this like a pre-incarnation Jesus, you know, talking about his crucifixion and yet being looked on by the righteous in the new Jerusalem? Um I believe Isaiah 53 puts it in the third person. They will look upon him who they pierce. But I was pleasantly surprised to see it here in the first person. You know, the Jews probably saw it as metaphorical, right? Like they pierced God's heart by idolatry. But we Christians would take it very literally. Jesus was literally pierced for our sins. Uh -huh. 
And it says you will mourn for him as someone mourns for an only son or as somebody mourns for a firstborn. And Jesus is both the only son of God and the firstborn of creation, you know. Uh, in that great day of mourning, uh, but interestingly, the people do so separately. It says that this group will be mourning by themselves, and this group will be mourning by themselves, and by themselves, and by themselves, kind of like eight or nine times. It keeps on saying these different groups will mourn, but they're all separate. Uh, so I'm not sure of the spiritual significance of that, but certainly the, you know, the solemn thought that our sins pierce the Son of God causes us to all introspect personally. Uh, Further thoughts on chapter 12? Ready for 13 then? Yes. Okay. Chapter 13 starts out, in that day, a fountain will be opened. And then I'm thinking, if verse 1 says, in that day, is this a continuation of chapter 12? It's another time that I suspect that they put maybe a chapter division where they shouldn't have. Um, but this is a good news prophecy here, uh, at least for a moment. In that day, a fount will be opened for sin and uncleanness. I think that means to resolve sin and uncleanness, right? Like a fount of purity comes to resolve the sin and uncleanness. It says idolatry and false prophets and unclean spirits will be purged from the land. Even someone's own parents will thrust them through when they prophesy, and I'm assuming this is meaning a false prophet, since in the previous chapter it was talking about false prophets. So, man, treacherous times, right? Even among the family. Mm -hmm. It says, in that day, prophets will be ashamed of their visions, and instead they'll want to be shepherds, right? They'll dress up like shepherds, and if someone asks them, no, no, I'm just a shepherd. I've done this for a long time. But it says they will be asked about the scars in their hands, Mm -hmm. We will see, say, those are the scars I received in the house of my friends. Mm -hmm. And this is a verse that is used significantly in the spirit of prophecy to refer to uh, Jesus. After the whole great controversy is wrapped up, those scars remain. And, you know, perhaps there'll be children or perhaps there'll be people who never heard of the crucifixion and are asking Jesus about the scars. I received those in the house of my friends. Think of it. Jesus went to visit his own people, his friends, and got scarred, tortured, crucified because of it. How sad it was us. Yeah, we're the friends. He came to our house, yeah. Sister Susan, were you wanting to say something? Yeah, that, that phrase, the end of the sentence, the end of the verse is so painful. Okay. Where was he pierced? Where was he wounded? Mm -hmm. In the house of my friends. Yeah. It's just, um, he still calls them my friends. That's so profound too. Because it would be one thing to be wounded in the house of your enemies, but to say it's the house of your friends. Mm -hmm. apparently By my friends. By the house. ones, uh, the treatment that Jesus got when yeah. he came. Yep. It was just enough beside 101,000 other reasons prior to just say you know what if you want to get destroyed go get destroyed be my guest but yeah. no yeah. right so through this chapter and other chapters i'm finding individual verses that are very powerful but it's i don't know for some reason it's not like the narrative weaves them all together yeah. it's not in a way that i understand Same but it's here. Just like this is the third time that we found a little section and wow that's so meaningful Early and you actually reading. enjoy it, but it's like, what's the part before it? I'm not getting it, but that's yeah. those little. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, similar to like when Jesus um, opened the scriptures for the people to understand his crucifixion and resurrection, it may be that even in heaven, he'll he'll explain the scriptures and it'll all open up and oh yes, of course. Whereas now we just see glimpses. What does Paul say? Now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. Are we okay to continue with verse 7? Yes. Mm -hmm. Verses 7 through 9 go back into poetry. So imagine reading this with that added aesthetic dimension. Uh, it says, strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. 
again, Jesus, right? He is the good shepherd. He was stricken. Uh, my hand will be against the little ones. I don't know what that means. I, I didn't want to skip it because I didn't understand it, but I have to admit, I don't know quite what that means there. Uh, two thirds will be destroyed, but one third shall live. And those one third shall be refined and tested like silver and gold. They will call on my name and I will answer them. And I will say, this is my people. And each of them will say, Yahweh is my God. Amen. So it ends happy, but it's happy for a minority, right? Two thirds are stricken and one third survive to say Yahweh is our God. That's the opposite of uh, the ratio of the angels that have fallen. I was thinking of that. Yeah, very true. Very true. And I guess somebody who would be like a strict dual predestinationist would say, well, that's God's will and God's will is sovereign. I see this as like a, a sad prophecy. You know, I believe fully that God wants all to repent, doesn't want any to perish, but all to come to repentance. But in his wisdom, he actually, and of course, in his perfect foreknowledge, he prophesies something that is actually against his will and tragic for him, that it will be, in order of this, a minority that come through it and are saved. God did not come to this, to humanity to save part of the humanity. He yeah. came to save all humanity. Right. Yeah. But I guess uh, it's a choice. Mm. I wish it wasn't a choice, but yeah. it's a choice. Is it, uh, is it in 1 John where it says Jesus is the sacrificial atonement for all humanity, especially those who are being saved? I know there's that interesting phrase in the New Testament. He's the propitiation for all our sins, especially those of being saved. Sounds like Romans. Okay, yeah. I'll double check and I'll put a band on the bottom in the YouTube. Okay, are we ready to go on with chapter 14? Yes. Yeah. Okay. It says, oh, in verses one through nine are poetic here. It says, the day of Yahweh is coming and plunder will be divided in your midst. Plunder being divided was always a good thing for the victors, right? Uh, the victors got to amass all the wealth and then distribute it among the people who helped participate in it. It says, enemy nations will surround Jerusalem and defeat it. Half will be defeated and go into captivity, but a remnant will be saved. So again, a portion being lost and a portion saved. Yahweh will go forth and fight against those nations on the day of battle. It says his feet will touch the Mount of Olives and split it in two, making a large valley. Um, I have seen once a preacher talking about, this is at the second coming of Jesus, that his feet will touch the Mount of Olives mm -hmm. and flatten it into a big plain. But then in the New Testament, it says Jesus won't touch the ground at his second coming, right? Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, we'll go up to meet the Lord in the air and thus we'll be with the Lord forever. So I'm thinking that this is the third coming of Jesus after the millennium. Jesus comes down and a great plain is made. Uh, and then it says you will flee through that valley uh, like from an earthquake. And it mentions an earthquake in the time of King Uzziah. Apparently, there was a pretty significant earthquake during the time of that king uh, in Judah's history. Thus, Yahweh, my God, shall come with his saints, neither day nor night, but there will be light in the night. And that reminds me of Revelation 21 and 22, right? They will need no lamp or light of the sun. God will give them light. So, mm -hmm. A lot of this stuff is reminiscent, but again, I can't, it's like I can't put the jigsaw puzzle pieces together quite. Yes. It says, living waters will flow out from Jerusalem. Made me think of the water of life flowing out from the throne in Revelation 22. Uh, and it will flow in two directions, to the eastern sea and to the western sea. Now, in historical Israel, obviously, the western sea would be the Mediterranean. But wow, from Israel to get to an eastern sea is super far, unless you go southeast to the Gulf of Arabia. But And then I was also thinking, you know, taking this literally might cause a problem too, because the Apostle John said in Revelation, he didn't see any sea in the new heaven and the new earth. But That's just how true. this jives, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, another possibility is this could be conditional prophecy about the plan A of making uh, Israel the magnet point for all the people to come to God. 
And now it is the gospel going to the Gentiles, which brings the whole world to God. Possible. Uh, it does say the water will flow regardless of season. And here in Southern California, we're familiar to the same things. The Santa Ana River flows sometimes, <laughs> right? When there's rain, it flows, but in the dry season, it doesn't. But this river will be always flowing. And that's remarkable in the dry season. It says, and Yahweh will be king over all the earth. The land creates a large plain, as we talked about. And Jerusalem is raised up. I don't know if literally it's placed on a hill in the large plain. Uh, the people will dwell in safety. And that certainly seems reminiscent of the New Jerusalem. Verses, it, it goes unpoetic for a couple of verses, but then 11 through 15 again is poetic. Uh, it says there will be a plague on those who fought against Jerusalem. Their skin will decay. Their eyes will decay. Their tongues will decay. I'm thinking, could this be like a description of the last destruction? It says there'll be great panic and neighbor rising, raising hand against neighbor. Judah fights at Jerusalem and the wealth of nations, gold and silver and apparel are gathered together. There's also a plague on all the animals. That made me think, of course, of Egypt's plagues. It says it shall also happen that those who are left from the nations will come to Jerusalem year by year to honor the king and observe the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles was the first feast in the calendar year, and it commemorated uh, the exodus from Egypt. They would live for a week in these little houses to remember, little kind of shelters to remember when Israel was in the wilderness. And those areas whose families do not come, those places will not receive rain. They mm. will receive plague. And Egypt is given as an example there. Mm. The phrase holiness to Yahweh will be engraved on the bells of the horses. And I was remembering that same phrase, holiness to Yahweh or holiness to the Lord was on the forehead of the high priest in the Old Testament, right? Yeah. And of course, bells are a cheerful way of announcing the approach of something. So as the horses come, these bells that are proclaiming holiness to Yahweh. Okay, yeah. Yeah, uh -huh. And the pots will also have the phrase, holiness to Yahweh. Those who sacrifice will cook in those pots, and there will not be a Canaanite in the house of Yahweh. The part of this glorious uh, vision of the future is no Canaanites, which to me, <laughs> you know, I never had a problem with the Canaanites. So I was like, why are they excluded? But when you think of the Israelite worldview, the Canaanites were the constant thorn in their side. Wow, a future without Canaanites. That was part of the glorious vision for them. And with that, we come to the end of the book of Zechariah. Wow. 14 chapters. We did uh, four of them tonight. Yeah. Wow. Okay, we are continuing on with the book of Malachi now, and sorry that the other friends had to depart. We actually ran up against another church meeting that was needing to start, but uh, they will be back for some closing comments and the closing prayer. Look forward to seeing them in a few minutes. Uh, starting the book of Malachi now. Malachi is the last prophet of the Old Testament, and I was just checking in a commentary. He said that he uh, prophesied probably a century after Zechariah. And a contrast we're going to see with Zechariah, Zechariah had some of these soaring visions of what Israel could become. Remember, coming out of the exile, it was like a new start for them. Uh, but by the time of Malachi, things have gotten back into kind of a lukewarm, compromised form of religion. In fact, that uh, commentary was bringing up some similarities with Laodicea in the book of Revelation, uh, which I firmly believe we're <laughs> existing in nowadays. Malachi means my messenger. And so it could have been uh, the prophet's literal name, or God could have simply been saying, this message comes from my messenger. Malachi is not mentioned in any of the other uh, books of the Bible. So it's not really known whether that was his literal name, but we go ahead and call him the prophet Malachi. Now, right here in verses 1 and 2, we're going to see a rhetorical device that's used uh, several times, seven or eight times throughout the four chapters of Malachi. And it starts so kind. Uh, it starts with this message, I have loved you, says Yahweh. And then there's this rhetorical question back. But you ask, 
how have you loved us? And so that's what we're going to see. God gives a statement, and then they're saying, what, how, when, where? And some of these are going to be negative ones, too. So, uh, And he, God asks a rhetorical question back. Wasn't Esau Jacob's brother? I loved Jacob, but hated Esau. And look, his heritage is laid waste, yet you have a heritage. Edom has said, we will rebuild, but I will throw it down. And they shall be called the territory of wickedness. Your eyes shall see this, and you will say, God is magnified beyond Israel's border. Let's remember that many religions had uh, the idea of regional gods, but uh, God is saying when you see Edom's fall versus your success, you will say, wow, God's even being glorified beyond the borders of our own country. Um, another uh, ironically sad illustration here, fathers and masters get honor from their children and servants. Fathers get honor from their children, masters get honor from their servants, but where is my honor? I am your father, I am your master, yet the priests despise my name. And again, this rhetorical question, how do we despise your name? You offer defiled offerings on my altar. You may remember that from the Mosaic law, there were lots of rules about purity and apparently they're disregarding these principles. How do we offer defiled offerings on your altar? They're apparently unaware that uh, what they're offering is not sufficient for God. And first of all, God says, you say Yahweh's table is contemptible. I have no idea how a priest could say something like that and then be like, what to God? What's the problem here? Uh, it's, you know, the thing that is supposed to be sacred is contemptible and the priests themselves are saying it. Uh, and even worse, you offer blind and lame animals as sacrifices. You remember they were supposed to be animals in their prime. The best was to be offered. Because as we know, those sacrifices represented Jesus. Did God give the worst that heaven had to offer or the best that heaven had to offer? Jesus is the absolute best. Would your earthly authority, would your earthly governor receive such offerings of, you know, lame and blind animals? So many rhetorical questions. And I feel for God struggling yet again with his people after so many uh, times of disappointment, exile, bringing them back from exile. And yet again, they're just kind of halfway doing their responsibilities. But now, entreat, seek God's favor, that he may be gracious to us. Who among you would do so? I find no pleasure in you, nor will I accept an offering from your hands. Uh, from all across the land, it uses that uh, rhetorical device from the rising to the setting sun. My name will be honored among the Gentiles. And look, the Jewish people who got this prophecy probably had no idea how God was going to burst the borders of Israel. And now in every country, Gentiles are praising the name of the one true God. In every place, incense and pure offerings will be offered to me, for my name shall be great among the nations, says Yahweh. Maybe between the lines here, he's saying, Israel, don't think you are so exclusive. I can get my praise, worthy praise from the Gentiles as well. Repeating here what he has said before, you call Yahweh's table contemptible. You offer me the sick and the lame and even stolen animals as offerings. Obviously, one of the commandments, you shall not steal. And, you know, these uh, people living in the society who have wealth, they would rather give something that is stolen so it doesn't affect their own personal assets or something. Crazy. Cursed is anyone who makes such an offering to me. For I am a great king, says Yahweh. And my name is to be feared among the nations. You get the sense that God is definitely irked that he is being regarded too lightly. He is the great and sovereign king. He deserves our reverence, our fear, our worship. Not just like, oh yeah, give him whatever. Give him whatever. So that is chapter one. On to chapter two. Here is a commandment for the priests. Uh, NIV here says an admonition for you. Uh, probably that word could be translated either way, because uh, I was reading NKJV yesterday, happened to be an NIV today, so slight word difference there. Unless you give glory to my name, I will curse you, I'll rebuke your descendants, and spread refuse on your faces. Man, that is a sharp and a disgusting illustration. Uh, we've talked about many times how the primary orientation in Bible times was honor versus shame. To be honored is good and sought, but to be shamed is, uh, you know, it's to be avoided at all costs. And this has to be the utter lowest. You know, spitting on someone uh, is 
an insult in the honor shame society, but to smear refuse dung on their faces, that's what God says he will do to these priests if they refuse this commandment, this admonition. Then you will know that this commandment is with you. I made this covenant with Levi. Remember, he was the tribe that had the priests in it. I made this covenant with Levi for life and peace. He feared me, was reverent before me. Truth was in his mouth. No injustice was on his lips. He walked with me in purity. The lips, obviously meaning the words of a priest, should be true and wise. People seek the law from them. He is a messenger of truth. But you have departed from the way, causing many to fall. You've corrupted the covenant. You've shown partiality in the law. Therefore, I have made you contemptible before the people. And I have to tell you, as a pastor, this reminds me that we have a responsibility. We are different than the priests were in the Old Testament. In a sense, we're all priests now, right? Uh, Peter talks about the priesthood of all believers, and that's one of the high principles of Protestantism. But um, religious leaders particularly, in that people will look at them and draw their conclusions of God from them. Woe, woe be upon us if we are dealing with deceit, lies, cheating, you know, financially or adultery, any of that stuff it brings disrepute upon God. Woe to spiritual leaders who, I mean, any of us can falter, but get out of the ministry before a scandal blows up while you're in the ministry. Um, and then uh, the rhetorical question, haven't we one God and Father? So why do we deal treacherously with each other, profaning the covenant of the fathers? Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem have committed treachery and abomination. He has married the daughter of a foreign god. You may remember that Nehemiah, which was also after the exile time came and found people intermarrying with the surrounding nations. I do praise the Lord that now that the gospel has gone to the Gentiles, that isn't such a thing anymore. But in the plan A period, where it was about the nation of Israel, that was a big sin for them. Uh, may God cut off those who do such, yet bring an offering to him. You know, how backwards? Hip hypocritical. Um, I don't believe the word hypocritical is in the Old Testament, because I believe Jesus coined that term uh, some 400 years after that. Here's the second thing you do, the second bad thing. You fill the altar with tears, so God will not receive your offering. And again, this rhetorical question is, why not? God has seen how you treated treacherously your young wives. He gave you your wives as partners, and his goal was to uh, establish households to bring up godly children. So take heed. God hates divorce. And divorce has been a... Uh, you know, a sore spot in the history of the church. You could say that the Church of England, the Anglican Church, split away from Catholicism because the Pope wouldn't grant King Henry VIII a divorce. And so, you know, is King Henry VIII a hero or a villain? Um, God hates divorce. Obviously, Jesus talks about why Moses permitted it, because the people's hearts were hard. But it, it devastates a family, particularly the children, and it rips apart a society. God hates it. Um, should it be prevented to the point that abusive relationships or obviously adultery in the relationship, it's just impossible to get a divorce when one person has obviously walked so far from living covenant life, um, is probably the lesser evil. Same thing, our hearts are hard, so it's permitted in society, but it is so tragic and sad and God hates it. I can imagine God looking down on us and seeing how loving relationships turn into hateful ones and the family split, and the children are wounded, and the society is wounded. Um, probably one of the few places in the Bible with the phrase, God hates. So, come on, friends, let's work it out. It is a hundred times better to work it out with whatever issue you and your partner have, rather than offend God, hurt the hearts of the children, and wound our society. Uh, divorce. God hates divorce, for it covers one's garment with violence. You have wearied Yahweh with what you say. Really? In what way? By saying evildoers are right in the eyes of Yahweh. So woe to a society, and again, woe to religious leaders that call wrong right. And I guess the alternative, call right wrong. Woe to those. Here's the other thing. In what way? Also by saying, where is the God of justice? The priests, the leaders are saying, 
where is the God of justice? As if, uh, I don't know, he hasn't shown up. What's, what's wrong? You're supposed to be encouraging the people. And you are to be pursuing the justice in the meantime of God's not immediate presence. Let's pursue, this is obviously from all through the minor prophets. Let us pursue justice as we wait for the Lord to come with his kingdom. Moving on to Malachi 3 now. Oh, Malachi 3, so beautiful. Uh, I'm going to read the text, and then we're going to play a clip from Handel's Messiah, because beautiful passage from Handel's Messiah. I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says Yahweh Almighty. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? Or he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness. So praise the Lord for sending his messenger and purifying. This is obviously messianic, which is why Handel, the Protestant composer, put this in Handel's Messiah. Handel's Messiah, most famous for the Hallelujah Chorus which takes uh, some text from uh, Revelation, but enjoy here this part from Malachi chapter 3. The Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Continuing on with verse 4, God continues, So I will come near you for judgment and to purge sorcerers, adulterers, perjurers. Right? That's lying under oath, although any lie is hateful in God's sight. Uh, purge sorcerers, adulterers, perjurers, fraudsters, oppressors of the marginalized and aliens, uh, and those who do not fear me. These are repugnant in God's sight. And may all those characteristics be far, far apart. I, Yahweh, do not change, so you are not destroyed, O house of Jacob. He's saying, if I was a changeable God, you would very likely be destroyed. But when I make a covenant, I mean it, and I don't just change it or erase it. You have turned from me, but return to me, and I will return to you. It is not too late to restore this relationship. And then here's this rhetorical device again. How are we to return? I don't know if these guys are feigning ignorance, or these are... Uh, you know, legitimate questions here. 
Uh, but God accuses them, you rob me. First of all, stop robbing me. And then again, how? How do we rob you? With your tithes and offerings. And this is a well-known passage, particularly in Adventism. If a minister in Adventism is going to Malachi, it's probably for either the divorce verse or the tithing verse. And not for bad cause. You know, these are very clear passages, and I'm thankful for them. But I like that we're reading, you know, all the chapters and coming across you know, after a few chapters that we hardly ever visit, here's something that we do visit and, you know, hang important doctrines of our faith on. Uh, you rob me with your tithes and offerings. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. You can test me in this, God says, and see if I will not open the floodgates of heaven and pour out a blessing so big that you can't even receive it. Pests won't come, vines won't drop their fruit, and the surrounding nations will call you blessed if you will do your part in returning to God, what is his from the first place? It is a partnership that God calls us into. We depend our lives and our future and our salvation on God. Is it such a stretch to trust him with 10% of our income? He promises, this comes, you know, this is in Jesus's principle also. Seek God first, seek, seek his kingdom, his righteousness. He will make sure you have all that you need. So what does tithing do? It makes us live a little more humbly. Uh, you know, you could drive a 10% nicer car, live in a 10% bigger or nicer, newer house. But I think it also inoculates us against um, covetousness, trying to keep up with the Joneses. Because I'll tell you, every time my wife and I get a paycheck, I, I do that tithe. I do it online now. Uh, and I do that knowing, you know, that could be a car payment. That could be dinners out and fun things and travel. But I would rather have my relationship with God. And, and and to have God's blessing, I would not trade God's blessing for 10% more income. Um, I'm not saying if I were to stop tithing, you know, necessarily lightning would strike my house or something like that. But why sabotage the relationship when it is but 10% of what God permits me to have? It's all from God. Uh, Deuteronomy 18, he's the one who permits us to get wealth from either the strength of our hands or the work of our minds. He has given us all of this. Um, didn't mean to get off on a tangent here. Um, you have said harsh things about me, God continues in Malachi. How <laughs> have we said harsh things about you? You have said it is futile to serve God, but the arrogant prosper and evildoers are blessed. Even those who challenge God will escape, you say. A group of God-fearers, uh, so this is coming out of what God is saying now, this is like narrative. So a group of God-fearers confirmed and wrote up a scroll of commitment to God, and God observed this, and God claims them as his own, his treasured possession, whom he will treasure and spare. He talks about them as jewels, right? You are my jewels that I will uh, spare and treasure. Love that idea. Uh, even the song in our hymnal, right? Uh, when he cometh, when he cometh to take up his jewels, all the jewels, precious jewels, his loved and his own. It's a children's song, kind of, but uh, not intended for children here. Finishes off saying, you will see a distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. You know, I long to see that distinction. I feel, I guess I resonate with, you know, also the psalmist. Why is it that the wicked prosper and those who seek God seem to suffer in their bodies and suffer in their circumstances? Many theological reasons, one of which is, uh, you know, uh, the devil lets those who are on his side live well versus he persecutes those who are uh, dedicated to God. Um, you know, I wonder too, suffering is not an easy one, but I have to trust God in the meantime. First of all, Jesus was poor, said, blessed are the poor. The disciples live very humbly. Obviously, we know the vast majority of them died from persecution. So we should not count it strange when we live humbly, simply, even poorly you know uh we should be able to get by again that promise god knows what you will need he will fulfill your needs but uh we almost have a distorted view of needs in north america versus you know to be able to live well to have relationships to be satisfied in life with fulfillment yeah i say it's better to live normally or even below the average with fulfillment rather than some who do live luxuriously but have a a vacuous hole in their souls. And I'm not condemning the wealthy. Plenty of them do have purpose and are wonderful people. That wealth can be used for uh, philanthropic, uh, you know, 
and great service community, uh, all sorts of things. But to each as God has permitted. And let's not be covetous. Come on. All right, last one. Malachi chapter 4. The day is coming, burning like a furnace. Don't doubt that God's judgment is real. The arrogant and the evildoers will be like stubble. I was shaving earlier today and I saw that stubble with the shaving cream fall into the sink and I thought of this verse. That's what they will be like. There will be no root or branch left to them. I'm thinking that this is in terms of the genealogies. Remember how in Bible times genealogies were so important? And, you know, there was that illustration of a tree, right? Every family has roots and branches. Uh, and, you know, maybe also the illustration of a tree being burned up. There won't be a root left or a branch left. I think it also could have a genealogical significance. But for you who revere my name. Oh, and Lord, please have this. The son of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. You will go out and leap like calves released from the stall. You know, young calves are so energetic and they leap with joy for just being free. And that's what we will be like. Maybe the stall represents our containment or oppression now in the world of sin. And when that stall is opened up, wow, the freedom with which we will leap. Then you will trample the wicked. They will be like ashes under the soles of your feet. You know, when you take wood, wood is good for a lot of things. It floats. You can build a boat with it. You can build a house with it. You can uh, do a fire and get warmth from it. But the ashes, the stuff left over, it is good for absolutely nothing, just to be trod on. And that is what the wicked will be like. I, like God, don't want there to be wicked who are destroyed. I would so much rather everybody comes to repentance and everybody lives. But the prophecy is that simply isn't going to happen. Many people are going to choose the other side of the great controversy. Even by seemingly not making a choice, people who um, just live secularly, non-religiously, uh, to whatever degree they are, just uniting themselves with the world rather than with God. Uh, destruction and disappearance is their lot. Oh, and I have to say, I am so thankful for this passage and others like it because it shows that the judgment, the, the purifying fire uh, that consumes has an end point. It's not quenchable. In fact, in, in that you can not bring firefighters to douse it, but it will burn itself out and it will be like ashes, which you can walk on without being harmed. Uh, contrast that to the majority position of Christians who believe that hellfire is this continuous popping, sizzling, burning, boiling, broiling, torturous, painful uh, thing forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Uh, it will be painful for the wicked, but I praise the Lord that it has an end time. And thank you, God, for giving the message to your servant Malachi of it being like stubble and ashes. Uh, continues here, latter part of the very short chapter. Remember the law of my servant Moses. The decrees I gave him at Horeb, that means Mount Sinai, for all Israel. Horeb was just another name for Sinai. But remember Mount Sinai. He is the testimony in the last chapter of the Old Testament. And by the way, no New Testament chapter says forget the Ten Commandments. See, I send you the prophet Elijah before that great and terrible day comes. Now this definitely had a fulfillment in John the Baptist. Jesus said that he, John the Baptist was the Elijah who was to come, if you can accept it. There's also the two witnesses that come in Revelation 11 who come in the spirit and power of Elijah. Now, futurists, pre predominantly evangelicals, would say that's going to be literal, like Elijah and Moses come down. Uh, we tend to fall on the side believing that the two witnesses are the two commandments, the two Old and New Testament that both bear witness to God's truth. Um, hey, if it turns out to be two literal people, I'll praise the Lord either way. Whatever God wants to do, I will say hallelujah. But um, and it's not even so much the man, it's the power that accompanied the man, the spirit, the Holy Spirit that accompanied Elijah will have a great showing in the last days. We talked about just in Zechariah, the latter rain that we were looking forward to. So please, God, send your Holy Spirit. Do whatever it is specifically that you have in mind to do, Lord, to make a great final call to the earth that everybody will make their decision and nobody will be ignorant uh, when the judgment. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the children to their fathers. Family reconciliation is uh, core to what happens when hearts are converted. It's not an appendix. It's not um, 
you know, off on the side. It's a major part. Lord, please bind us. How sad when families fight within themselves. I've seen it a bit. Uh, you know, when there's multiple children and there's a death and there's a will to be, I mean, uh, children will sue each other and not talk to each other for decades over, you know, a parent's estate. But, oh, let families be unified. I don't get that. Uh, maybe being an only child, but, I mean, I can imagine. But, man, when greed comes before family, tragic. Right? God, please, yes, through the spirit of Elijah, please reunite hearts of fathers and children together. And the last part there, or else I will come and strike the land with a curse. So God greatly wants there to be reconciliation in the society. The alternative is the land. So that finishes the short final chapter of the short book of Malachi. Hope it has been a blessing for you. And this officially brings us to the end of our Read Through the Bible 2021 effort. Uh, we return now to the group for some closing comments and a final prayer by Sister Rosa. Thank you and God bless. Well, thank you, Pastor, so much for your dedication in doing this. It's been very uh, enjoyable for me. Good. Amen. Likewise, yes, I, I agree. Love these discussions. And we'll, of course, keep the discussions going through uh, Steps to Christ together starting in two weeks. True. So. It's been exciting to go yeah. a whole year reading the Bible. Amen. Praise yeah. the Lord. And I feel it has brought us closer. Absolutely. To and to us. Amen. To one another. Okay, let's Thanks. pray. Dear Father, it is such a pleasure to have gone a whole year reading your word. We feel the wealth that is inside us. us and we... Hope we can apply it in to all areas of our life and that we can remember the good to do the good and the bad to avoid the bad. Thank you um, because Jesus was willing to do everything to save us. How can we not want to be there? Please help us. Help us that we can... Um, Stay faithful to the end. No matter what, remind us that you are with us and that you're going to give us the power to, to finish the race. Thank you for Nicholas. Thank you for Mike. Thank you for Claudia. Thank you for Jackie. Thank you for Elliot. Thank you for Susan. Thank you for everybody else that maybe I, I am forgetting but I'm not forgetting uh, Gerald. Thank you. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Love, Love you all. Thank you, you all. Bye. Bye, bye. God bye. bless you. Take care. Bye. Bye. bye.